Welcome to Claris Engage 2020 and this session, an introduction to the FileMaker Data API. Uh, my name is Steve Winter. I've been a fairly regular speaker at uh, previous uh, DevCons before. I've been using FileMaker since before it was last owned by Claris even. And uh, I run a UK-based company called Matatero Solutions. We specialize in FileMaker integration, uh, often doing work for a number of different clients integrating FileMaker into existing systems or bringing existing systems into FileMaker itself. Uh, as well as uh, being a very keen traveler and cyclist, I spend a lot of time uh, out on the road and on my bike. In this session, um, it is very much a beginner session, but we are going to move quite quickly through that process. <laughs> Um, there are demo files and code which will allow you to replicate everything that I do in the session. And of course, because this is being recorded, you can rewatch sections as many times as you like. Um, some experience with JSON will be beneficial as we go along, but it's not essential. We'll, we'll cover everything in enough detail that uh, you, you'll quickly pick things up. Uh, during the session, we'll take a look at uh, an introduction to REST. We'll have a look at where REST and CRUD meet. Um, we'll have a look at a, a tool called Postman, which is very useful for working with APIs. We'll look at how authentication is taken care of and the tokens that you use with the data API. We'll have a look at how you go about configuring FileMaker Server and a FileMaker Custom App to use with the FileMaker Data API. And then at the end, we'll take a look at um, how you can go about interacting with a number of different systems and different types of system, depending on the particular problems you're trying to solve. Before we get into all that level of detail, I thought I'd start by showing you the, the beginning at the end, or the end at the beginning. Um, taking an example of a FileMaker-based inventory management system, a WordPress-based website, and we want to be able to display product data, prices, etc., on that website. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with WordPress and with, with the plugin structure, the plugin architecture of WordPress. And there's a very simple FileMaker Data API plugin that you can use in a WordPress site. In this demonstration, I want to show how you how it's possible to get data out of FileMaker using the FileMaker Data API and into a WordPress-based website. On the left, I've got a FileMaker app. That is my inventory system. It shows the currently available products in my system. To the right, I've got a demo website. If I select products from the menu, what I hope to see is a list of the products that are available coming directly from FileMaker. You can see that it shows the same products in the same order. If I drill down into one of those, there's more detail available there. If I come across to FileMaker, I see that this product is currently out of stock. If I drill into the details of the product, and I know that some units have just come in, so 10 units have arrived, they've come into stock today. At this point, FileMaker has updated. If I return to my inventory list, it shows that there are 10 units on hand and that the product is now in stock. Over in my website, if I return to my product list, that data is pulled through in real time. This product is now available and in stock. I drill down and the 10 units that have just been recorded in FileMaker are also appearing immediately in the website. So this is one of the very, very simple things that we can do with a FileMaker Data API. And it provides a very quick and efficient way to get data from FileMaker into another system, in this case, into WordPress. As I mentioned, this is using a WordPress plugin, and we're actually going to come back and look at that later in the session. But for now, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction to some of the possibilities that are available with the FileMaker Data API. So, let's rewind back to the beginning now and take a look at some of the base principles and mechanisms that are in place here. The FileMaker Data API is said to be a RESTful service. But what does that really mean? Well, let's ask our friend Wikipedia. Wikipedia says that representational state transfer, or REST, is an architectural style that defines a set of constraints and properties based on HTTP. 
Web services that conform to the REST architectural style, or RESTful web services, provide interoperability between computer systems on the internet. Now that sounds like we were just what we were just doing in the connection between the FileMaker app and our WordPress site, where they were able to communicate with each other. Let's look at this a little bit more. Wikipedia goes on to say that REST compliant web services allow the requesting systems to access and manipulate textual representations of web resources by using a uniform and predefined set of stateless operations. Now there are some fairly significant concepts that are being covered in this. Let's take a look at a few of them in more detail. Textual representations. So we know that everything we're doing with REST should be a textual representation. This does have some pretty important considerations when it comes to dealing with container content, because somehow we have to convert that to a textual representation if we're going to be able to use true REST. The next thing in here is about web resources. Think of a resource as being a record in FileMaker, and so resources means multiple records. Now, because this is web-based, that gives us some clues about how the underlying mechanisms work. The next thing here is that they are uniform. There will always be a consistent way of interacting with a RESTful service. And they use predefined terms. Because it's uniform, we know the format that will be taken, and it will always, in theory, be the same. Finally, the last piece here is that it's about stateless operations. Every transaction must be completely self-contained. There's no knowledge on the remote side of anything about what the requesting site has done previously. Now, this is achieved through a combination of the URL parameters, the payload being sent, and the HTTP method that's being used. But how does all that work over the internet? Our first definition said that REST uses HTTP, or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. All of that started with a guy many of you have probably heard of, called Tim Berners-Lee, who in 1989 was working at a European research centre, and he wanted to be able to share information with colleagues around the world. And so HTTP, and then later the World Wide Web, were born. HTTP is a protocol, kind of like REST. Within the HTTP protocol, there are a total of nine different methods, some of which will be more familiar than others. Which one you use depends largely on the type or nature of the transaction that's being performed. The first that we look at here is GET. If you think in terms of CRUD, then GET is the read part of it. It's also the method that a web browser uses when you type in a URL and you hit return. You're getting the web resource, which in that case, in a web browser, is an HTML page. But with an API, it would be one or possibly more records in some other textual representation. The last part in this definition on screen, that it should have no other effect, it's quite important. So a GET request shouldn't be used to modify a resource. Remember, think record. The second method we're interested in is POST. So what if we do want to modify a record? Well, that depends a little bit on exactly what we're trying to do. If we want to create a new record, then we need to use POST. The definition from Wikipedia says that the POST method requests that the server accept the entity enclosed in the request as a new subordinate of the web resource identified by the URI. Let's not worry too much about what that's saying for now. It's going to become clearer as we go along. But for now, trust me that this is the create in CRUD. Basically, make a new record which contains the stuff that I'm sending you. This is the HTTP method that a browser usually uses when you complete a form and cl click the submit or button. It's posting that data to the server. The third method we're interested in also brings us to the ability to modify data. The patch method applies partial modifications to a resource. 
So this method isn't used by browsers, but it's the U in CRUD, the update. It assumes that there's already a record in existence, and then what you're doing is modifying one or more fields in that record. So that's different to POST. POST is creating a whole new record, whereas PATCH is updating one which is already there. The final method is basically what it says on the tin. It's DELETE. The DELETE method deletes the specified resource. So if we look at this in terms of resource URIs in FileMaker, then we begin with HTTPS, the server that FileMaker server is running on, then depending on the method we want, the URI. Now you can see here that the concept of being very, very consistent is quite clear in this. The URIs are all structured in exactly the same way. And exactly what happens is determined by the method that's used and to a degree whether or not there is a final record identifier in that URI. As many of you probably know, records in FileMaker tables have an internal record ID. Now that's different from any ID field you might create in a table. It's numeric, it exists in every table under the hood, and it's mostly sequential. And those are the, URI, the IDs that would need to be used in the record ID in a URI. Postman's a great tool for working with APIs because it allows us to perform any of or all of HTTP methods in a very simple to use interface. It allows to create, save and share scripts which can be used by others. And in the session resource materials, you'll see that there's a set of Postman files for you to experiment with. It's free to download and in the blog post that I'll share at the end of the session, you'll be able to find a quick and easy link to get to it. On the left, I have Postman. Postman is a tool that's very useful for working with APIs. And it's a way that we can very easily explore what's happening with the FileMaker Data API without having to be too concerned with writing a lot of code. So Postman, I've got set up so that we have our four act actions that we wish to perform. Create, read, update, and delete. Now, you will notice in the URIs that we specify the use of a layout. And for that reason, what I've done is created a separate interface file, which is the one shown on the right at the top. This is an interface file that limits the number of fields that are being exposed by the data API. At the bottom, you can see my main interface for my contact solution. In my post, when I create a new record, I need to specify the fields that I want to populate. We do that using a JSON object. The JSON object must always have a key called field data. And then within that, we specify the various fields and the values that we want to set. If you look to the right, you'll notice that at present, there are 5,000 records in my database. When I hit send and postman, it calls the FileMaker data API, which results in the 501st record being created with the data that I specified, Dr. Frederick Spoon from Claris Inc., who's the chief cook and bottle wash. You can see that immediately those details have appeared in FileMaker, both in my interface file and of course in my base file. In the response that comes back from FileMaker to a post request, to a create request, we get re returned the record ID. And that's that internal record ID that was generated by FileMaker for this specific record. We also get a message back to say that there was a code zero, so there was no error and that everything was all okay. If I take the read, the get request, you can see that at the end of that URI, we're prepending the record ID. So in this case, I want to send back the record ID that I just got from create. In this case, 8602. When I perform that get against that record, you can see that I am returned some data. The first section provides us with an overview of the data file that we're communicating with. The name of the database, the layout, the table that underlies that layout, the total number of records, how many were found and how many were returned. 
Now, of course, there was only one found because we were asking for a specific record by number. The second part of the payload that comes back is the data, which contains again that key field data and then all of the details that are on the layout within FileMaker. We also have the option to transmit portal data at this point. We get the record ID again and the modification ID. Finally, we get a messages block, which again shows code of zero and a message of OK. Now, as you would expect, if I come to FileMaker and I make a change here and I add in a phone number for Fred, I commit that. When I run that get request again by pressing send and postman, that data updates. If I wanted to send more data, then I can simply add more fields to my layout. As I add fields onto the layout, then they will be sent in the FileMaker Data API. Let's quickly pop a fax number in here and an email in here. Commit the record, make the request again. And you see that both the fax and the personal email fields are now included in the data set with the data that's there. If we wanted to use the data API to update data, we'd use a patch request. Again, we use a JSON object in the body. We specify that there's field data and we specify which field it is that we wish to update. In this case, we're going to update the office email. When I send that request, the patch request is performed, the data is updated in FileMaker, and you can see that the response comes back to tell me that the modification ID has been incremented as we would expect. The last action we can perform is a delete. Delete doesn't require any body. It simply says use delete. It says specify the specific record that you want to delete. We hit send and Fred disappears. Our database is back to having 5,000 records and we can see that we get no response body back, which makes sense because we've deleted the resource. So there's really nothing to send back. We still get that standard messages block that tells us that everything worked as we expected it to. As you've seen, the URIs used by the FileMaker Data API use that internal record ID. As you may know, that record ID is created automatically when a record is created, but under certain scenarios, it can actually change. For example, if you have a production app which you wish to make changes to, you work on an offline copy of the app to implement those changes over the course of a few weeks. You then clone the file, take the production database off your FileMaker server and import the data into the clone. This can, and more often than not, will result in record IDs of records changing. And that is why REST must really be treated as being stateless. A remote system should never store the record ID of a record and must always perform a GET first to locate the current record ID before it attempts to patch or delete. I'm sure right now many of you are thinking, but what about security? Surely if these URIs exist for our databases, this must be a massive security risk. Well, the good news is that in the immortal worlds of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. FileMaker's really taken some good care with this and they've really got your back here. There are three things that you have to do. You have to enable the FileMaker Data API on your server. You have to enable the FM REST extended privilege for at least one user of the app. And then that user has to authenticate before they can use the API. Now in the demo that I just did using Postman, I skipped over that part because I wanted to keep things as simple as I could. But now let's take a look at each of these in a little bit more detail. The easiest way to enable the FileMaker Data API is to use the FileMaker Server Admin Console. 
It is also possible to enable it using the admin API. However, the admin console is by far the simplest way. Begin by signing in. One important thing to note is that you need to have a custom SSL certificate installed before you can make effective use of the FileMaker Data API, so ensure that you've imported a custom SSL certificate. From the Connectors tab, select the FileMaker Data API at the left and click the Enabled toggle. And that's it, it's done. Based on your license conditions, you'll have an annual limit of data which is available. It shows you that limit, the amount of data that's been transmitted by this host and all hosts that use the same license certificate, and when that data limit resets. You can verify that the data API is operational in FileMaker Server 19 and above by using an endpoint that will return the product info. It shows the various parameters of the FileMaker server that the Data API is running on. It's worth mentioning that the web publishing components are not required for the FileMaker Data API. They are only required when using Claris FileMaker WebDirect. As a slight digression, here's how much data is included with your server license. It's the number of users you have, multiplied by 2 gigabytes per month, multiplied by 12 months to give you your annual allowance. So for example, if your license was for 3 users, you got 2 gigabytes per month per user by 12 months, gives a total of 72 gigabytes. One thing that's important about this is that it's only outbound traffic that's being monitored. So it doesn't matter about anything that you're posting or patching into your FileMaker Data API, it's only the data that's coming down. This also doesn't include any container data. In the packet, in the JSON payload that comes back from a GET request, you get a URI to the container content itself in the actual JSON packet, and that's what's metered, not the container content itself. This usage is aggregated across all of your users, not just for those who use the FileMaker Data API. So for example, you could have a single user account that's set up just to use the Data API, and that account could consume all 72 gigabytes of your license allowance. You may recall in the JSON payload that comes back from each request to FileMaker Server Data API that it shows the messages and then a code. Ordinarily, we want that code to be zero because that means no error, everything is fine. If you exceed your data usage allowance, then you'll get error 953 returned as the code in there. Um, and if you do exceed that, it's possible to purchase additional data packages if that becomes necessary. This file is the main data file that we've been using for the demos that I was doing in Postman. If I come to File, Manage, and Security, you'll see that there are a number of accounts here and that there are some which use two different privilege sets, one which is called Data API Read Only, and one Data API Full Access. If we take a look at the Data API Read Only privilege set, you'll see that it has view only across all tables, it can view layouts, it has no access to value lists, and it can only execute scripts. The key piece that we need here is at the bottom in the extended privileges. We have to ensure that this account has the FM REST extended privilege applied. That's the permission that's necessary to access through the FileMaker Data API. Now I've called this account read only because as you can see, it can only view. It can however view across all tables, and I would suggest that in many situations, you want to make your Data API accounts even more restrictive than this. Really target accounts and privilege sets to just very, very specific tables or layouts that the account needs in order to fulfill the requirement of the data API use that you're building. If we take my data API full access account, when we look at that, 
you will see that it has the ability to create, edit and delete in all tables. Again, I really do feel that that's too much power that you're giving this account. It should be locked down to just the few record, the few tables or the few layouts that it needs in order for it to function correctly. But again, the key thing here is that the FM REST extended privilege has been enabled. As you can see, it is of course possible to create multiple accounts that use those privilege sets. In the demo that I did with Postman earlier, I didn't worry about the authentication because I wanted to keep it simple and just look at the specifics of the different HTTP methods that we were looking at. But let's switch back to Postman now and take a look at how that authentication process works. On the left, I've once again got Postman. On the right hand side, I'm showing you a small section of the FileMaker Server Admin Console for the server that I'm about to authenticate with. I have another action here in Postman which is called Authenticate. You can see that it's performing a post and that it's doing so against the endpoint sessions. In the authorization configuration for Postman, I'm telling Postman to use the basic authentication method, which is that which the FileMaker Data API supports. I give it a username and a password. In the body of this post, you'll see that there is nothing specified because all I need to do is actually create that request in order for FileMaker server's data API to generate a session and a token. If I send this request, you will see that I get two parts to my response. I get the response which contains the token as specified here and then I get a message back to say that everything was OK and it gave me a code zero. This token I then need to use for my subsequent requests. On the right, you can see that this connection has now shown up that there is a client who used the username SJW full access from this IP address using the data API. In each of the requests that I make, I then use the authentication and that authentication uses a bearer token, which is the FM API token that I received back. So Postman is able to extract the token from the response of the authentication and then to use that in the subsequent requests that it places by storing that token in a variable. So now what we need to do is start putting all of these pieces together. We know what REST is, our server is ready, our app is ready, we have a user with the right credentials. Let's go forward and connect to the world. When I showed you my integration with WordPress at the beginning, I said that we'd come back and look at that in a little bit more detail. Let's take a look at that now. Back in our WordPress website at our products list. If I switch over to the second tab I have open here, I'm now logged in as a site administrator. I mentioned at the beginning that the interaction between the WordPress and the FileMaker Data API is done through a plugin. With that plugin, you have to configure a number of settings for it. The server, the port, the database that you want to use, a username and a password. There are also a couple of other settings which enable you to not verify SSL which can be useful when you're testing with the Claris provided SSL certificate. You can also set the locale, which determines how currency is displayed if you choose to use that. If I take a look at one of the pages, let's look here at the product. You can see that the product list is a simple WordPress page. It has a title, it has uh, some introductory text, and then it has an FM data table. That table specifies the layout that should be used, which field is the unique identifier for that, where users should go if they click in onto one of the products, and then it specifies the fields that should be included in the table, and then the types that should be used, that it's a thumbnail of 20 pixels, and that the fifth column is currency. That's for the price. 
So by making changes to this configuration, I can change the columns that appear. For example, if I remove category from here and one empty field, and I update this page, when I reload my products, we can see that that category column disappears. If we take ourselves back and take a look at the product details page, it's using a very similar approach as well. It's using a different WordPress short tag called FM data field. Again, it specifies the layout, the ID field, and the field that we want to display here. So this is basically saying, I would like to get the name field from this layout in FileMaker and place it into the table. And that's what's generating this name here. You can see that we then have a table which repeats the same process using the FM data field short tag to pull different fields from the layout and display them in the table. Now the plugin is sensible enough that it won't constantly load the record for each of these different fields once it knows that it's already retrieved the record that it needs. The plugin is well documented and all it's available in GitHub and it explains the different options that are available for the two short tags that are used. The FM data table, which is used on the products page, and the FM data field, which is used on the detail page. The URL for the plugin is included in the resources and also in the final slide of this presentation. I wanted to do a demo that used a programming language that everyone should be familiar with. And so I thought that I could create a simple scenario where I was using FileMaker Go in an offline sync type environment to connect to FileMaker Server using the Data API. Let's take a look at that. In this demo, I'm mirror, mirroring my iPhone onto my desktop, which you can see in the left hand window. On the right is the FileMaker server hosted file that we've been using for many of the demos over the course of this session. What I'm hoping to show here is that by using insert from URL, we can communicate with the FileMaker data API from within FileMaker itself. For example, when I click load new leads in the top right corner on my mobile, it makes a call to the data API and pulls in new leads for my mobile salesperson you can see that that has taken them in to a new lead. I might choose to update this lead by giving Mr. Creasy a title. When I commit the record, you can see the status indicator has gone orange, showing that this contact has been updated locally, but not yet moved onto the server. If I switch across to FileMaker Pro, and I find the corresponding record, you'll see that Mr. Creasy does not yet have a title. When I tap the icon in the top right on my mobile, a call is made using the data API to update the title in the main file. Similarly, I can create a new contact as well. Here is Mrs. Demo User. My indicator is showing in the top right that this is a new contact and doesn't exist remotely. If we look on the file on the right, we see 5,053 records. I tap my icon, it goes green. We can see that we now have 5,054. 5, if I show all records and scroll to the last record, you can see that Mrs. Demo User has been created. Now obviously sync is an extremely complex topic, but this is a very simple process that can be done using FileMaker scripting. If we take a look at the script workspace for this solution, you can see that there are a number of scripts here which correspond to those which we were looking at in Postman. We have the login, we can get, create, update, delete, and then finally we have the sync record. And these scripts are all being run in FileMaker Go. If we take a quick look at this login script, you can see that we specify all of the variables that we need. The server, the database, the layout, the username, my super secure password, which I'm hoping no one will remember. And further down, 
we say the URL that we wish to connect to. This is the login script, so it's the session's endpoint. We pass in some curl options, and then finally we do our insert from URL, saving the response into a global field. Further down, you can see that we use the JSON get element to extract the response.token and to store that in another global variable. When we want to get records, we check to make sure we have that token. If not, we perform the login, and then we perform our get request against our server and the databases, the layout, and the records. Once we've done that, we're looping through, making sure that we got a valid response, and then looping through to import and update the records that have been found. Each of the scripts takes a similar approach. It checks to ensure that it has a token. If not, it logs in and then goes ahead to, in this case, create the data JSON object that will need to be sent. And we come through and in our options for our request, we perform a post by setting that data to the variable that we stored our data in. You can see here that we're sending that header of an authorization bearer and passing in the API token. It's a copy of this file that's running on my mobile. All of these files are included in the resources for the session, so they'll give you a good opportunity to look through the way in which we can use the FileMaker Data API from within FileMaker itself. In this demo, I want to come back to one of the comments I made about locking down the accounts that are used. And that's because we're building a web application here. We want to chart data from our FileMaker table into our website. That data is going to be pulled using the FileMaker Data API. Now, one of the things about using a front-end framework or a front-end application like JavaScript is that the source code of that application is visible to users if they choose to go looking. You can see that I've got a chart here showing all of the states that the various people who are in my database live in. I've also got a script which rather evilly starts to move people around. For example, it looks like we're, we're a little short of people in Indiana, so what we'll do is we'll take everyone that lives in Los Angeles and move them to Indiana, and we'll shuffle a few other people around as well. You can see that the chart is reloading periodically. The indicator comes in the top right corner, and that's as it pulls new data from FileMaker. FileMaker itself has a script that runs and pauses, moves some people, runs, pauses, moves some people, so that we get that data updating in the screen. If I switch over to the source code that this site is based on, we can see here that this is a JavaScript file. One of the things that we have to be able to do in our JavaScript file is we have to provide the credentials for the FileMaker server in order that the data API can be accessed. As you can see, my super secret password is once again clearly visible and anyone who chooses to view the source of my web page can see that. And that's why it's very important, particularly if you're going to use a front-end application, like a JavaScript web page, that you make sure that everything is well secured. This is the chart script that runs. You can see that it's set to every 5,000 milliseconds, so every five seconds, it should refresh the page. This is the piece of the script that does most of the work. It's called fetch data. You can see here that we're building up a query. We're saying that we want column two to be greater than zero, and we want to run a script before the request occurs called set states. Now, in order to run that script, we perform a post, and we're using a virtual list technique. So we're doing a find against the virtual list, but we're passing in this data ahead of time to say we would like the set states script to run before we do the find. The find we want to do is in our virtual list, find any value in column two which is greater than zero. That's basically saying show me all of the states where there are more than no people present. The result is that when the script is called, the chart updates as the data in FileMaker changes.
In my final demo, I'd like to show you how we can use the FileMaker Data API to upload container content into a hosted solution. Mirroring my phone to my desktop, and that's the window on the left. Although, as you can see, that's uh, an operating system on a mobile device that isn't usually compatible with uh, FileMaker systems. However, with the Data API, we managed to unlock that opportunity. On the right hand side is a remotely hosted file which is going to receive an image shortly. I open my FileMaker image uploader on my mobile. It's a very simple app. It has one button which lets me take a photo. Just going to point my camera at the elephant collection. And we'll just snap a, a quick photo there and Click the OK button, which will begin the process of encoding the image, uh, creating a record in the remote database, capturing some metadata about the location of the device where this is all taking place, and then uploading the image to the remote server. This is uh, quite an old phone, and so it takes a little while to work through that process, but you can see that uh, in our FileMaker window, we now have a map showing where in the world I am at this time, and the image that I've just taken has appeared in the container to the left. Back in our app, we've got a, an alert to say that uh, we've been highly successful in uploading the image we've just taken to FileMaker. This app is built using about a hundred lines of JavaScript uh, and a, a framework called NativeScript, which allows a single code base written in JavaScript to be exported as native apps for both uh, iOS and uh, that other mobile operating system that is uh, quite common out in the world. Another great use of the FileMaker Data API to unlock access to FileMaker from other solutions. All of the documentation for the FileMaker Data API is hosted on your FileMaker server, which makes it really easy to provide the how-to to external parties that may need to be able to connect to your apps. Within the documentation, the credentials and the name of the database and layouts they need, they can be up and running in no time. Obviously, you don't want to be reinventing wheels at every opportunity. And there are a range of different packages and integration resources out there that really help in bridging the gap between having nothing and getting a full session up and running. The top bullet here is an article that's been curated by Mark Denice where he collected together a range of resources that are help with integrating the FileMaker Data API. If you're looking at FileMaker or JavaScript, then there are great resources from this session that help you there. For PHP, .NET, Python, and Node.js, there are packages that are built by members of our community to help make integrating the FileMaker Data API into those languages much simpler. For WordPress and NativeScript, again, there are the resources from this session. If you're interested in continuing learning, then this URL has a series of eight workshops which you can follow online at home over your own time, which take you through the processes that we've discussed in today's session and lead you further into your adventure in working with the FileMaker Data API. All of the resources from this session are also included in the download that's available from that first URL.